we are the Catalan independentist resistance, and you are listening to a new update from Radio Hadrian in Free Catalonia. Hello, good afternoon, welcome to Radio Hadrian. This week was the anniversary of the French Revolution. The, the, that statement in itself isn't terribly significant because every 14th of July, as we all know, is Bastille Day, and that is a celebration of the French Revolution of 1789. The 1700s were quite an interesting period in terms of revolution or sovereignty. Apart from the French Revolution, we had two significant events in both Scotland and Catalonia where we actually both lost our freedom. So the French gained, the French people gained freedom and Meanwhile, in Scotland and Catalonia, we lost our freedoms. Okay, 1714, here in Barcelona. The siege of Barcelona ended the War of Spanish Secession, and it saw the unification of Spain. This day, it happened on the 11th of September. Now, some of you might know or recognize that date as being a day that is still celebrated in Barcelona or in Catalonia as La Diada, although these days La Diada is seen more as the day when everybody who wants independence comes out in Barcelona waving flags, showing the merchandising off and having, it's a party, it's a festa. It doesn't move anything towards independence. But the, a little bit later in that same century, a few years later, in 1745, at Culloden, which is near Inverness in northeast Scotland, we Scots also lost in our final confrontation with the Jacobites. Uh, of not with Jacobites, sorry, uh, our final confrontation of the Jacobite revolt. This was part of a religious civil war between the Catholics and the Protestants. Scotland has been a divided religious country for centuries, and this particular revolt was led by the Jacobites, who were principally Catholics from the north. From the highlands of Scotland and Episcopalian, mostly Scots, but with some from the north of England, from Manchester, from a Manchester regiment and the French support. This war, this battle, should I say, it wasn't a war, it was a battle at Culloden, was lost. The Scots were slaughtered, or should I say the Catholic version of the Scots was slaughtered by the Hanoverian troops, which were basically the English troops, it's a German name, but we know that there's a lot of German connections in England with the, the royal families, and we actually lost this very, very badly. The Jacobites were slaughtered. The Hanoverians were mainly Protestant, Lowlanders, yes, there were Lowlander Scots, so we had Scots against Scots, Ulster men from the nor north of Ireland, and Hessians from Germany and there were also Austrians as well. Later, after the war, after the battle, the sort of result, it wasn't a union of the crowns, but it was the unification of Scotland and England under the British crown. It also marked a significant division between Highlanders and Lallanders. Lallanders are the lowland people, the people who live in the central belt, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Ayrshire, where I come from, Lanarkshire, and that division has continued. I often think of Scotland as being almost like two zones of one country. And this is when it started. The Battle of Culloden and the slaughter of the Jacobites marked the beginning of the so-called civilizing of the wild Highlanders. And it diminished, it began to diminish the Gaelic culture through language and the clan system. The diminishing of the Gaelic language lasted for many, many, many years. And in fact, when I was going to school, so many of you will know this too, Gaelic was an endangered language. It probably still is, actually, but it has seen a revival. The Gaelic culture has seen a revival. And there are now schools which teach in Gaelic. I think there's one in Glasgow and an East Kilbride, perhaps. I'll go into that more in another program, though, because language and culture are so entwined that this was a very significant act, getting rid of the Gaelic language. 
because if you get rid of language, you get rid of culture. However, um, put the Gaelic aside for a moment because what also came out of came out of the Battle of Culloden was the Old Alliance. The Old Alliance, as any Scot who's listening to this will tell you, and I hope that this is interesting for people who don't know a lot about Scots history, was an alliance which started really as a military and a diplomatic force way back in 1295. That's before the Battle of Bannockburn. It was certainly before the Battle of Culloden. It was before any union of crowns. And it started because Scotland and France had a con common enemy. That enemy naturally being England. But I qualify this because I do not for one moment consider England as my enemy. I have English family, I have English friends, I lived in England. And even the use of the word enemy is quite unpleasant for me. But that's how we, we term it. The enemy was England. And Scotland and France united. They became a combined force to rise up against the common enemy of England. So there we get the old alliance. It later became a cultural alliance. So we started off with military and diplomatic, and then we became a cultural alliance, especially including food and drink, and interestingly enough, dual citizenship between France, French citizens, and Scots citizens. Probably one of the earliest cases of dual citizenship ever in the world. And I'm a dual citizen. I'm a dual Australian and British citizen. But the idea of having Scots and French citizenship is very appealing. Um, that citizenship actually only ended in the early 1900s. I think it was 1903. Over the centuries, this old alliance had many battles, mostly in France, and battles that were fought and lost with the help of thousands of Scots mercenaries. Up to 12,000 Scots men fought in France at any one time. Sometimes they were successful, and sometimes they were abysmal failures. And it's thought that the failures were due to the fact that these, the alliance between Scotland and France resulted in many Scots living in France, and, or at least temporarily, but sometimes permanently, and enjoying a very nice lifestyle with abundant food, abundant wine, well paid, well rewarded, and that this softened their ability to fight in battles. And in one particular battle, the entire Scots group were wiped out, every single one of them. However, the alliance had some interesting side effects. It had food and wine side effects, which I think are still, um, still in existence today. For centuries, Scots merchants were given privileges, particularly in French wine, in very good French wine, privileges that were not given to the English merchants. So at a time when the world was much smaller and we didn't have Australian wines or Californian wines and possibly not Italian wines, French wine was considered to be an absolute treasure. And the Scots were entitled to enjoy this. However, the ordinary Scots weren't. They enjoyed whiskey and water. But the, let's say, the upper class or the elite enjoyed fine French wine, which incredibly frustrated their English counterparts. The old alliance continued for many centuries and finally was diminished or sort of really came to an end during a period where that we refer to as being the Reformation. Now, at the time of the Reformation, Scotland was a Catholic country. Mary, Queen of Scots, had returned to Scotland as a 19-year-old to take up her rightful crown in Scotland. She had left Scotland as a one-year-old and had been taken to France by her French mother, where she later married the Dauphin, the French king. So Mary was queen of both Scotland and France. So here we have another connection between Scots, uh, the Scots and the French. Mary then returned to Scotland 
to become queen or to take up her throne and had a, an extremely uh, violent and difficult reign. This is probably the subject of another program, although it's beginning to sound like a history lesson. It's not meant to be that at all. So uh, Mary's reign in Scotland was fraught with problems and resulted in the end with her being beheaded by her cousin, Elizabeth of England, who wanted to obviously get rid of her competitor and unite England and Scotland. So Mary brought with her many French things. She brought she brought all of her French cooks to Scotland. She introduced French cooking terms into Scotland, terms that are still used to this day. For example, so here's some French, Scottish French words for those people who are not Scots and who are listening to this. We have the word ashet, which in Scotland is used for making pies. It's made of metal and it is used for making pies, mostly for steak pies. And that comes from the French word assiette, meaning a big platter, a big plate. We have, in Scotland, we have collops. And I don't think you get the word collop in any other form of cooking. But it's, it's a type of, um, a cut of meat. And it comes from the word escallop. We have gigot. In, Scot in Scotland, it's generally pronounced as gigot. But it comes from the word gigot, which is French for a leg of lamb. How toadies. How toady is... A chicken that's been boiled, and it comes from the French word étudeau, a boiling hen. We have saibies. I have used the word saibies outside of Scotland, particularly when I lived in Australia, and nobody ever had any idea what I meant, except for French people, because they have a similar word. Well, it's it's not similar. It's almost the same. Cibouille. And that word means it's a type of a, a spring onion, a small onion that you put in salads. So Mary was responsible, Queen Mary was responsible for bringing these things into Scottish cuisine. And they're still used today. And what other things have continued? Okay, the citizenship ended in 1903, sadly. Um... Ah, sorry, yes. Um, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit about Mary, Queen of Scots, because she is a very loved his historical figure in Scotland. Okay, um, during the Reformation, the Protestant John Knox devoted himself to hunting Mary down, hunting Mary, Queen of Scots down. And when she died, the political scene in Scotland changed. The uh, religious scene shifted. It didn't change completely. Scotland is still a semi-Catholic country. But... It changed and really brought about the end of the old alliance as it was as it had been known for centuries. Today in Scotland, religion and li religious divides still causes problems. That's another topic for another day. So today, Scotland and France don't have an especially strong relationship. This is quite a historical relationship. Um, but I think it's worth creating and encouraging a relationship between Catalonia and Scotland because of our quest for independence. We both lost our freedom in the same century while, Fran while the French people won theirs. And I think it's well worth thinking about how we can create this alliance. This radio program is one thing, but there must be other ways we can do it. And if anybody has any ideas, we would love to hear from you. We are setting up Radio Hadrian Facebook page this week. We've been extremely busy for the last couple of weeks, and um, apologies that we haven't been able to, to do that before because we did say we would do it. However, this week that page will be set up, and we would really like to hear ideas from you because I think this idea of an alliance between a new alliance between Catalonia and Scotland is quite a powerful thing. We are facing this, the same barriers to independence. And I think in Scotland, if people are more informed about what's happening here in Catalonia, and if people here, if the Catalans, are more informed about what's happening in Scotland, we can create quite a powerful unity, a united front. So while what I've just talked about is not particularly political, 
I think it's really important, well, I, I think it's important or it's worthwhile to try and develop this relationship between our two countries. There is a relationship there. It's somewhat superficial, though, and I think we could do a lot more with it. Okay, um, for the next 10 minutes, I have a slightly different thing I'd like to talk about. Again, it's not political, it's not about the Scots independent, Scottish independence movement, and it's not about the Catalan independence movement. But it's about oppression and what happens to a people when they are subject to being colonised and language is taken away from them. So a few moments ago I mentioned that the end of the Jacobite Rising also saw a very deliberate and concerted effort to obliterate the Gaelic culture. And if you if you remove language from people, if you ban language, then you remove culture. Language and culture are so entwined. Here in Catalonia, language has also got a significant part in the history. Up until not so long ago, um, Catalan was banned. So any Catalan people who happen to be listening to this, who, who obviously speak English, will know that you were not allowed to speak Catalan on the street or in public places. The only place that for many years under Franco, the only place that you could speak Catalan was in your home. So in by doing that, you make a very big statement and you affect the future generations because if you ban a language and it's only spoken within the home, that language is never going to be spread and it's never going to reach the next generation. It's not going to get into the schools. And there are older Catalan people who can speak some, but they can't read and write it because they learned how to speak it without getting a formal education in it. The Catalan language received a massive revival and now it is the official language of the Catalan government. It is also the official language of education. It is a language that instructions are delivered in in every single school in Catalonia. That keeps a language alive. It is complicated a little bit that here in Catalonia you have also Spanish, so you have to, you, you hear two languages. There are many, many Spanish speaking people that migrate here and never learn Catalan because they don't go to school. And for whatever reason, whether it's time, money, lack of interest, or um, being anti Catalan language, who don't learn to speak Catalan, but their children do. There are many migrants that come to live here from other countries who, although their children learn to speak Catalan at school, the adults don't because Catalan is not a world language, Spanish is. We have a very different situation in Scotland with languages. I can't ever imagine Gaelic becoming the standard language in Scotland. It's too difficult. We have such a, a mixture of language. Our influences come from different places and we don't have a pure language. I wish we did because language is powerful and it's cultural, but we don't have that. So I think here the Catalans have an advantage in having their language as the official language and more significantly being the language in schools. If I think about languages and the places I've lived in, I lived in Australia for three decades and I worked with Indigenous Australian people. This is going to be the subject of what I'm going to talk about next week. I worked with Indigenous people and I learned an awful lot about what happened what has happened through the centuries to Indigenous people in Australia. And this is a massive topic. So I'm going to gloss over it a little bit today. And then next week, I'm going to talk about this in much more depth. Through my work, I worked with elders in southeastern Australia. I worked with people from the Gunai group. They come from Victoria. They come from the coast. 
northeastern Victoria, going towards New South Wales. They spoke some of their language, but only because there were people within them that had made an effort to keep that language alive. Once upon a time, there were 500 indigenous languages around Australia. 500. Now, in 2017, I think there would be less than 50. Even that is probably on the high end. There is a map which shows the indigenous languages of Australia when white people arrived and colonised the country. These languages were never written down. Australian Aboriginal people didn't write things down. They were passed on through word of mouth. But when white people came and they enslaved indigenous people, they put them in forms of detention camps, they forced them into slave labour in rich people's houses, and they barred them from speaking their languages. And because the languages weren't written down, most of these languages died out, and they are still dying out. With some languages, there may be one native speaker left, and one native speaker isn't enough to keep a language going. I come back to my, my comment earlier about if you kill a language, you kill a culture. I find that the relationship between Indigenous Australian languages and Catalan language and the hodgepodge of language that we have in, in Scotland really interesting when it comes to culture and oppression. Scotland and Catalonia are striving for independence. They're striving to maintain their dignity and deal with their own future, to be in charge, in control of their own future. Indigenous Australians have had that taken away from them. Since the very first day that white man arrived in 1788, January the 26th, 1788, their culture has been diminished and diminished and to the point where they would, in my opinion, be the most disadvantaged culture in the world. The most disadvantaged culture in the world because of systematic Australian government's policies and wiping out language. If I come back to Catalonia and I look at the language situation here, it is quite powerful. It's not perfect, but it's a lot more powerful than what's happening in Scotland. Scotland has got a mixture of language. I'm, I'm not saying we've got a mixture of languages. We have English Scots and then we have Gaelic. Gaelic is a minority language. English Scots is not, but English Scots is dying out itself. I come from Ayrshire, where we had, or we still do have, a very strong dialect with words. Um, people who are listening to me now who know Ayrshire will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Cheryl, wh whose radio station this program goes out on, Cheryl's also from Ayrshire, so she would know what I'm talking about. The language of Robert Burns, Rabbi Burns. It doesn't even get taught in schools. As a teacher, I taught for a period in Scotland in the last few years, and I was quite dismayed to see that the children had to do a special unit on Scots words in a Scottish primary school. I was appalled at that. Those children should be speaking Scots naturally. They should not have to do a special unit on Scots language. It is their language. Again, another subject, education and our so-called independent education system. A wonderful topic for another program. And as a teacher, I'm very passionate about that topic. But I see a similarity between Scots children and Indigenous Australian children. And I can say that correctly because my Indigenous friends in Australia embraced me and said, you understand what it is like to be oppressed. You're Scottish and we consider you to be one of us. So I don't say this lightly. I see a similarity between Scottish children at school and Australian Aboriginal children who are not getting educated in their own languages. Australian Aboriginal children have great difficulty in learning a lot of subjects. Indigenous Aboriginal children are very similar to the children in Scotland, less so to Catalan children, and it is because of language. As I just previously mentioned, Indigenous Australian children have great difficulty in learning things in mainstream schools, which is where most of them have to go. They don't, they're not born into this world speaking English. Their parents are not native English speakers. They have developed a form of what is known as Aboriginal English, which is a dialect, but it is a mixture, not pidgin, it's not Creole, but it's similar in that it's a mixture of what remains of 
their Aboriginal mother tongue and what they have been forced to learn. And it's a very interesting form of English. It has many rules that don't fit in with standard English, though. So when these little children go to school, they come to school sometimes with mother tongues, sometimes with two or three native languages and Aboriginal English. And then in school, they are forced to listen and try to learn things from teachers who speak standard English. And these children struggle with that. So school becomes a terribly difficult place for them. And of course, what happens with children who, who struggle in school and who are not getting the correct support is they end up dropping out of school, which doesn't help things. There are wonderful movements taking place in Australia to not necessarily reverse this, but certainly stop it getting any worse because the situation had become so bad that children, Aboriginal children, were in great danger of receiving no education. Now it's wonderful because we see Indigenous people going to university, we see children finishing secondary school, and we have a slight revival of some Aboriginal languages where it has been fortunate to have native speakers still alive. The same thing is happening in Scotland, slightly different, but in Scotland the children are not receiving a Scottish education. They're receiving a very British education, generally, unless they are lucky enough to go to a school which sticks its neck out and says, no, we are going to teach our children in the Scots dialect. But the idea that they do units in Scots words or in Scots language or Lallans is absolutely appalling in a Scottish education system. And John Swinney, education minister, talks of reforms, he talks of changing things and meeting the needs of young people in Scotland, but he won't do anything. He will do absolutely nothing because he is a politician, he's driven by processes, and he knows that to genuinely change a system like education will take much more than the SNP government, but under an independent Scotland, through UDI, through us declaring independence, we could do this. We can create a truly genuine education system that turns out young people who think for themselves, who question things, and who are educated and not just trained. Thank you very much. I'll speak to you next week. Have a great day. Bye. Good afternoon, Scotland. Bona tarda, Catalunya. Uh, this is my uh, participation in the fifth chapter of Radio Hadrian. Thanks to all of you that are helping us spread this uh, program and helping us reach everybody in every country in the world. We need more people to listen to the truth, the truth that won't get delivered to you through mainstream media. Uh, this week, I would like to talk about the French Revolution briefly and a few brief comments on things that have gone on in Barcelona. Another thing I would like to dedicate some time about is the 25 years of the Olympic Games in Barcelona and the impact it had in the city and some uh, shadowy aspects of it that are not uh, frequently commented about. I would also like to comment on Theodore's Ash experiment and investigation about group behavior and how, it, uh, how we are affected by uh, the opinion of the group and how the powers that be use that through sociologists and uh, group uh, psychologists to avoid the truth being known by most of us. Then I'd like to introduce you to Joan Vives and Sole Vicente, which is uh, the big king major, maker in Catalan politics and which also has personal links with Scotland and we try to present him to the Scottish and Catalan public. And finally, we'll go on about changes in the Catalan government with views to the 1 October referendum. And it also has a Scottish ring, a Scottish link to it, because one of the three new ministers is Clara Ponsati, with uh, clear links to, to Scotland. Well, first of all, uh, without going into very deep analysis or analysis, uh, I'd like to mention, well, this is the week of the French uh, anniversary of the French Revolution. And uh, when I was looking to start with a quotation, what I found out is something that confirmed that we really need to check every source because we shouldn't trust, we shouldn't take anything for granted. And I had heard this thing about Zhu Enlai, the leader of communist China, 
which in 1971 with uh, Nixon was asked about what he thought the impact of the French Revolution had been and he is supposed to have answered it's a bit early to tell which was like 200 years which is something that served to perpetuate the idea probably right that Chinese is a patient uh, reflexive uh, civilization well it seems that actually he was referring to May uh, 1968 and that is then normal that uh, three years is not time enough to analyze the impact so more important than that is it 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 reaffirmed the necessity to double check everything because a lot of urban legends and myths that are about are not true what i would like to say about the revolution is only that we live in different times now and revolutions need not be bloody and with that uh, they don't need gadgeting but between that and the smile revolution that they pretend us to be having in Catalonia and similar concepts in Scotland, there's a lot of in-betweens. And it's not realistic that uh, you can get away from uh, ex-imperial powers like uh, UK and Spain that have uh, murdered uh, people almost in every continent, that by smiling and marching and voting through procedures we're gonna get it so we need to wake up and we need to do the thinking revolution which is finding our own information and becoming every one of us needs to be one army one civic army of one person and we should only trust information that comes from reliable sources it means things we've seen directly experienced directly or it comes from a prime source, somebody we can trust, like somebody really close to us that can confirm that. Everything the mainstream media tell us is a lie, which is there to deceive us. I want to, and this is a French week, or an important week in France, and Delia has commented about the old alliance between Scotland and France, and she has commented on the need of a new alliance between Scotland and Catalonia. I, I would like to really encourage people out there, both in Catalonia and Scotland, to have friends in social media with people from the other country. Because that's the way that they cannot they cannot lie to us. They're they're lying to us saying that we wish we we had the Democrats like like the British ones and we could do a referendum. And you think that by marching you'll get independence. It's very important to strengthen the ties between Scotland and Catalonia. And if you Next week, we finally will have the Facebook page for this program. If you know people from other countries which are trying to fight for independence, uh, no matter which continent, no matter which country they want freedom for, from, let's get them hooked on Radio Hadrian and let's get them contacted to us because uh, we really need to be strong and we need to collaborate. This program also wants to be the voice of those without a voice. And I'd like to put three brief examples of what we would like to use this program to do. This week, Delia and me have been proud to be uh, helping or putting our humble effort in trying to avoid the eviction of Cyclic. Cyclic was a, a reference video club in Barcelona, in the barrio of San Pedro. Video clubs are on the way out because of new technologies. But there's a very nice project in that part of the city where David Cabrera, which is somebody that really, really helped us in our moment of problems one year ago, to have a micro cinema and documentation video open to, to the neighborhood. And it's a very nice project. And uh, we know that the administrations are working together with David to find a solution for that. And we really want to encourage everybody to give its best because the neighborhood deserves it and David deserves it and it's the best is the best way to handle things we've also spoken this week with Eric Plankton which is a very relevant person in Barcelona not in the official Barcelona he raps in the metro in Barcelona a few hours every day and his raps are really really like a a kick in the shin because he talks about not so nice things and he talks about corruption and white collar crime and we hope that briefly we'll be able to have an interview with eric so 
uh, the the other side of Barcelona is known. And also, I hope I would like to thank Chema, the person from Cardadeu that has sent me an amazing, wonderful video uh, about the Kanak people in, uh, in the so-called French department of Nouvelle Caledonia, which uh, is a country fighting for for their freedom and it's a wonderful video uh, about how they manipulate us and how all of us are getting the planet plundered in benefit of very few people that uh, that slave us and uh, is on top of us so uh, this these are the kind of stories that we will try to bring to you in in radio hadrian and we are working to make this program, a reference program for all of you who want to live in a better, freer world than we do. This month, this month of July marks the 25th anniversary of the Olympic Games in Barcelona. As a very important person to me remarked recently, it seems that it's the games that meant the victory of a capitalistic, uh, very commercial Olympic Games. We commented that that possibly is because it's the first Olympic Games after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is the time which declared capitalism the victor of uh, of the conflict between capitalism and communism. And that might be the case, but me as a Barcelonian that collaborated as a volunteer in the opening and closing ceremonies, we have to say that it's something that changed the image of the city in the world. Uh, it is. It doesn't. Uh, it it has opened the city uh, to the sea. Now Barcelona has beach. Well, some of us for twenty five years we had never been to the beach in Barcelona because it was separated from the city by a line of rundown empty factories that made it impossible, and some long due investments to connect the city. I mean, Barcelona has been plundered and oppressed by the metropolis and the Spanish empire. And uh, that was an opportunity to to catch up. Certainly, uh, Spain decided to have the Universal Exposition in Sevilla and the Madrid cultural capital the same year. So they had an excuse not to invest everything in Barcelona and uh, divide it, but so be it. And what I would like to mention, though, is that the importance of the Olympic Games but it has two black points. One is that the Games happened because of the intervention of uh, Juan Antonio Samarang, which is a famous Francoist. So um, in that case, we have to say that it's one of the few things where I think that something related to Franco ended up in benefit for the city of Barcelona. But it leaves a slightly bittersweet taste. But the other thing is that 25 years ago, it's the first time where a campaign that was uh, called Freedom for Catalonia, which had banners and balconies, and it was an opportunity to tell the world that Catalonia is not Spain. But it had the effect that several Catalan independentists were kidnapped and tortured by the Spanish state because they didn't want the independentist movement to do anything pacific, uh, any, anything peaceful, sorry. My English still not have to scratch. They didn't want the independentists uh, to make something peaceful that would tell the whole world that we don't feel members of Spain. So they detained people, they, they, uh, they put plastic bags on them and they did all the kind of things that uh, we associate to a dictatorship. And that was ordered by Juez Baltasar Garzón, which appears in the list of good guys in relationship to Argentinian dictatorship. So then, again, it all goes to show that nothing is black or white, and there's a lot of things that are not the way they tell us. Uh, the Olympics of Barcelona 92, though, also bear some contact with the fight for freedom. Barcelona has always been in the first row trying to fight for freedom and the fight for independence now is another example of that because Barcelona in 1936 it had like the popular Olympic Games where some people of uh, left-wing movements 
competed uh, as an opposition to the Nazi Olympic Games of 1936. And we have to say that it's in the same stadium that those games happened that uh, years later, the Olympic Games of Barcelona happened. So uh, that's, that's about what I wanted to tell you about Barcelona. In the next chapter, or the next thing I would like to comment about is the experiment that Theodore Ash did in 1951. And it's something that I think in the future, and when both our countries and lots of other countries following our example are going to be independent, it's something that's going to be taught in schools and universities, because we need schools and universities to teach people how not to be manipulated instead of being trained like they serve now to prepare us to be farm animals so we can be taxpayers, voters, consumers, and spectators of mass uh, shows so we don't think. The whole thing is based on people not thinking. It makes it possible for the powers that be to keep in power. This experiment and Theodore Ash consisted in having uh, several university students, like five, seven, and to put one line in the blackboard and three lines of very different uh, long or lengths. And they had to say which one was equal to the model given. The problem is that four out of five, and yes, we told you some weeks ago that theory of conspiracy theory is a conspiracy. These people conspired, yes, conspired. They were in agreement with the professor which meant that they said the obviously wrong answer. We're talking about a line which obviously was the same length and the other two were smaller. Well, these people gave the wrong answer. And guess what? 37% of people that were last, after they had heard four totally unknown people and with no uh, influence on them supposedly, say that the wrong answer, one of the wrong answers was the right answer, 37% of university students gave the wrong answer not to have to challenge the rest of the students. 37%. But what's more important, when they put only one of the four previous students saying the right answer, the number of people lying decreased or came down to only 5%. 5% compared to 37%. That's less than seven times minor number. So out of seven liars in the first case, if you only give them somebody, anybody, giving the right answer, there's only 5% of those who want to be in the majority. But there's 37% not capable of facing everybody. This is of tremendous importance to understand nowadays world. Tremendous importance. If we understood this, we'll be much closer to independence in Scotland and Catalonia and to be considered intelligent animals and not cattle animals that are brought to wherever they think we should go. We're talking about something that nobody, nobody, nobody in university would know. We're talking university students debating about the length of a line and still 37%. Now imagine the population is not university student, but a whole country, Scotland, Catalonia. And we're not debating about the length of the line, but the benefits of referendum versus unilateral declaration of independence. The numbers would go exponentially. But not only that, imagine that the four people before you is not unknown to you, but it's the parties, media, journalists, social media you love and care for. We're talking that absolutely 100% would lie. And that's why when somebody, there's three men lies in Scotland, that SMP works for independence, that was true in the past, but not anymore. The Nicholas Sturgeon works for independence, that has never been true. That's why she's put there by Wednesday to kill independence while pretending to want it. And third, that uh, referendums bring about independence. Those three are a lie. But to defend that lie, you need a unanimous response. In the media you consider to work for you, I'm sorry to disappoint you, it's not the case, Bella Caledonia, Wings of Scotland, and The National, and social media and everybody. So when somebody 
somebody who has studied, somebody using his brain or her brain, somebody who knows challenges, why referendums, when referendums don't bring independence, why Nicola Sturgeon, who is a member of Privy Council, cannot be bringing about independence, why the SNP was held by the powers that be to increase membership fivefold because it's the Trojan horse of Westminster to kill independence, these people, we get fierce attack lots of times from British shields, British malls, but lots of other times by innocent people that are alive by the other. Because they need unanimity, because otherwise it's like the emperor that is naked. So that's why they need unanimous response. That's why people complaining about the Scottish referendum didn't get any support. Briefly, I'd like to go into uh, the changes in Catalan government. The changes in Catalan government have brought in three new uh, members of council. One of them, uh, Kim Forn, which belongs to Federación Nacional de Estudiantes de Catalunya, and I used to be in it with him as well. And another one of the changes is Jordi Turull, which uh, is somebody who three years and a half ago told me that we would meet to debate about the fake question in the non-referendum of independence of 2014. And I'm still waiting. So we have one liar already. Out of two, we have one liar and one member of FENEC with Juan Vives. And the third one is Clara Ponsati. And Clara Ponsati is a clear Scottish link. Uh, she was presently the principal of the School of Finance in St. Andrews University. And not only that, but she's tax advisor of the finance committee of the Scottish Parliament. Thus, the, the relation with Scotland is big. But sadly, she's been appointed to be the, the minister of education in Catalonia. And we have a serious problem because the new minister of education is a liar. So I guess we're going to teach our children to lie from now on. And I say it's a liar because the 20th of June, 2016, she said in Villa Web that the 27th of September, 2015, we, the independentists, which had got 72 out of 135, so a majority, overall majority of four or five, we hadn't obtained support enough to declare independence. And that is an outright lie. And that's why we have her as a new minister. So we have a liar as a counselor. I would like to finish with something that might sound alien to you, but it's relevant. I'm going to talk about Joan Bibas and Sule Vicens. Joan Bibas and Sule Vicens was the force driving Federación Nacional de Estudiantes de Catalunya, the independent trade union and uh, university, which I belong to also in some running uh, post. And this person has been I'm not going to go into that with it because it would require more, more time. But basically, he is a person that he is the political uh, godfather of Josep Rull, Uriel Junqueras, and other members of cabinet. Uriel Junqueras has been anointed to be the next president of Catalonia after the referendum is lost in October. And this person has been uh, managing breakups and creation of parties for the last uh, 20 something years in Catalonia. This person now is the partner of Anarche, Anarche, which is somebody that has been destroying political parties and is leader of the uh, international, the EFEC, International Commission of European Citizenship. And she was contributor to Bella Caledonia. And he organized a conference I mentioned before in which Stephen Noon came to Barcelona and lied to us about the referendum. The head of strategy of the yes lied to us, and it was an act where Juan Vives was co-organizing. Juan Vives, he also was with his now partner, Anarche, organized something last year in a conference where Shona McAlpine lied to Catalans. Shona McAlpine, that works for Humza Yusuf, she lied to us saying that she personally was member was present in uh, exit polls, exit polls that the same Alex Aldo in his book, The Dream Will Never Die, 
said that he was sorry he had an organized exit poll. So she lied blatantly to Catalans once again. These two things were organized by Juan Vives, but Juan Vives also is uh, boasting that he made Oriol Junqueras president of Esquerra, which we have confirmed by other ways that is true. And this person who's right-wing, homophobe, uh, xenophobe, and everything which is against uh, what you would expect of Coop, which is left-wing and very uh, uh, in favor of all the social fights, supposedly, well, he did, he did telemarketing for this uh, group, and this is something that has made independence impossible. And we have somebody who's who's essential in in the whole Catalan politics, but nobody knows of him. And I happen to know that he works for Spain, and he knows I know. And he he was very keen on getting me institutionalized, so the truth doesn't come out. So, to summary yesterday, which is, we shouldn't behave as the group expect we should, because that helps the powers that be manipulate us. Uh, and then we also should look into Joan Bibes and Sulevicens, because most times, and uh, I think you should look for your own Joan Bibes and Sulevicens, there are people in the dark that are the puppet, ma the puppet masters of our politics. And uh, we should look for them to avoid following what they have in stock for us. It's been a pleasure as always. Please help this program reach everywhere because the truth, only the truth will set us free. Guanyarem. Let's do this. This has been another update from the Catalan Independentist Resistance from Radio Hadrian. Remember that you can follow us on social media, either on Facebook, YouTube, our Twitter account, Instagram, Google, Telegram, and also on eBooks.